ongoing A World of Difference series. What better way to pay tribute to the art scene in Cleveland and to local artists who have achieved national acclaim than through A World of Difference? While the arts allows us to celebrate our cultural diversity, A World of Difference allows us to celebrate our racial, religious, and ethnic diversity. With me today is Mary Louise Hahn, chairperson of this year's Cleveland Arts Prize. Mary Louise, why was the Cleveland Arts Prize established? It was established 30 years ago under the sponsorship of the Women's City Club to honor Cleveland-connected artists whose creative work had brought distinction not only to themselves, but to the city of Cleveland as well. Whose idea was it to have an arts prize? Oh, it's the brainchild of two wonderful people. Martha Joseph, who's been a leader in the cultural arts area in Cleveland for many years, and Klaus Roy, a composer and lecturer and very well known to your audience as the program annotator for the Cleveland Orchestra. How many artists have received the Arts Prize? Over 90 these past 30 years, and it's become quite a glittering list. What is the criteria for awarding an Arts Prize? The Cleveland Arts Prize goes to an artist whose work has been either produced or exhibited both nationally and locally. And while most of our artists have our residents of Greater Cleveland, that's not essential as long as there's a Cleveland connection. Who are this year's recipients? There are three 1990 prize winners. The 1990 prize for music went to Halim El Dab. Professor El Dab is co-director of the Center for the Study of World Music at Kent State University. The prize for visual arts went to Judith Solomon. Judith is not only a nationally known ceramist, she is a beloved teacher at the Cleveland Institute of Art. And the 1990 prize for literature went to Adrian Kennedy, a playwright whose works are shown all over the world and who was raised and educated in Cleveland. What are we about to see today? We're about to see a wonderful audio visual by Patricia Rambasek of Spectrum Productions. I think what makes this work so excellent is it's not only about three creative artists, but about the creative process as well. My career started in Cairo, Egypt. When I was in agriculture, I studied music in conservatory and actually worked on my own music and taught myself. So I was composing some music and finally, the music was performed, and overnight, my name all over the newspaper, you know, discovering an Egyptian composer. The critic was just overwhelmed by the sonorities and the avant-garde elements, and right there in 1949, somehow, after I became known as a composer, you know, your heart was sort of balancing all the time. You know, it was hard to do my agriculture work. The thing in my blood was music. And once I came here, the impact of America on me is to look back to my roots. First, they wanted me to go to Juilliard. I said, no, 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 I want to go where these Hopis are, <laughs> where these Navajos and the Pueblos. But then I sent that composition, it is dark and damp, to Tanglewood. And it came in the hands of Irving Fine and Aaron Copeland. And uh, so that was actually the beginning of my career in America. I developed as a small child a rather polite demeanor. I developed a kind of fearfulness. I always read a lot of books. So very often was living very much in my imagination. That combination led to a rather withdrawn person, a person who is really holding in many things that are very, very dear and many things that are explosive. So I guess when I got to be a baby about 29 or something like that, you know, these two personalities really just seem to almost in many ways divide and this explosive writer came out. And this explosive writer is just exactly the opposite of, uh, of how I generally am. I've always been very interested in the crafts. And I was always interested in building things three-dimensional. I also have memories of watching potters when we lived in Portugal in about 1966. And in my diaries, I found these things talking about going to these potteries in Portugal and being really fascinated by the wheel. I love to throw, the act of throwing. 
but I get more distance, I guess, out of the clay when I hand build. I guess I feel there's more freedom. I think my work has gotten a lot more sculptural. My earlier work in graduate school was mostly handmade paper and clay combinations. And I was really trying to get into the idea of what happens underneath the surface of ceramics, say that they were skeletons. This was what the pot would look like under the surface of the clay. My materials have changed. My colors have changed. But the way I handle the material is very similar. Some days I wish I could handle the clay differently, but I guess then it wouldn't be my piece. Actually, coming to the United States, open up my vision first to my own heritage to Egypt and then to the connection to the African continent and I was able to identify rhythms that came out of Egypt that's used in the pop music and the retention of African elements here I felt there was something else I needed to know that much more organic for some reason, something about life and things. So I left my, my limelight in New York and I ended up in Ethiopia, <laughs> in the villages. See, Ethiopia is one of the oldest nations that had Christian chants and they had a relationship to Egypt and they developed some secular music. So they contributed to, to the whole area of world singing styles. And I stayed three years, and it was quite an experience. One of the most important things that happened when I went to Africa was that my work had lacked a certain level, and that was a turning point in my life as a person, and it was a turning point in my life as a writer. And I really understood that I had only been writing about a tiny segment of the things that were inside me. And this journey gave me the tools to write about all of the, the forces that exist inside me. This is very important because, like most American blacks, we are a mixture of many things. And one of the things that brings us gratification is to come to grips with all of these forces. I really respond to geometry and the way colors are put next to each other. But I also like looking at folk art and just different ways of how people put objects next to each other. I like just the relationship, like what an apple looks like sitting next to a lemon. Somehow I make those ideas into pots. I'm much interested in architecture. I think that's where I get most of my ideas. I get an idea from a real assortment of places. You know, I'll be walking along and I find a piece of rust on the ground and that sort of has had this interesting flattened out shape and then I'll store that bit of information away and somehow all those parts come together in the pieces. I start with an idea of about a volume and then I start working and building up the walls. I guess it's like how an architect would work except they draw everything and I do everything three-dimensionally. Somehow in my psyche, my years at Ohio State became symbolical of racial hatred and how racial hatred can transform an innocent person from being trusting and highly optimistic and feeling an equilibrium with the world. And after my college years, I became a person who felt that I had lost my equilibrium. But I do want to make it clear that all of this is a symbol. I, I use Ohio State as a symbol. As I use my relatives as symbols, my children as symbols, myself as a symbol. I didn't know there were no Negro students in the English department. It was thought we were not able to master the program. They would allow you to take no more than two required freshman courses. After that, you had to apply to the English department to take courses that were all said to be for majors. In my dorm across from the old union, there were 600 girls. 12 of us were blacks. 
we occupied six places rooming together, two in a room. The other dorms, Canfield, Neal, each also housed a few black girls. The schools I had attended in Cleveland were an even mixture of immigrant and black. You were judged on grades, but here race was foremost. Very few Negroes walked on High Street above the university. It wasn't that you were not allowed, but you were discouraged from doing so. Above the university was a residential district encompassed by a steep ravine. I never saw this ravine until the two days I visited Bobby at his house. The ravine was where the faculty lived. A year and a half later, one of my baby twin daughters would be found dead there. That was later. Funny Else of the Negro is perhaps my most well-known play. It's had wonderful productions in Paris, London, Denmark, and has been taught in colleges and universities all over the world. Sarah is the heroine. She is a young woman who is alienated from everything, and this alienation ends in her suicide. This is her first monologue in the play. When I am the Duchess of Habsburg, I sit opposite Victoria in my headpiece and we talk. The other time, I wear the dress of a student, dark clothes and dark stockings. Victoria wants me to tell her of whiteness. She wants me to tell her of a royal world where everything and everyone is white. There are no unfortunate black ones. For as we of royal blood know, black is evil and has been from the beginning. Even before my mother's hair started to fall out, before she was raped by a wild black beast, black was evil. As for myself, I long to become even a more pallid Negro than I am now. Pallid like Negroes on the covers of American Negro magazines. Soulless, educated, and irreligious. I want to possess no moral value, particularly the value as to my being, I want not to be. I have no control over these things that I write. It really is true. They just come out. It's hard for me to believe that I wrote them. Ceramics takes its toll physically. You're constantly sort of picking up bags of clay and rolling it or throwing it, and then you have to put it into a kiln. You have to take it out of the kiln. You have to glaze it, put it back in the kiln. Making ceramics takes a lot of time. It's sort of a three-week cycle in ceramics. There's always something that has to be done with making pottery or sculpture. I work for a couple of weeks just making platters, and then I'll just work on large construction pieces. Usually I have some smaller pieces also being made when I'm working on the large pieces, just because the large pieces take so much time and concentration. In ceramics, there's always surprises. Every time you unload a kiln, every time you leave a piece out and you forget to cover it when it's wet and you come back and it's all cracked because it dried too quickly. And so it's frustrating on a lot of levels. For some reason, once you get addicted to doing clay work, you kind of keep going and you keep making more things and you say you're never gonna do it again and you're back there the next week doing it again. You know, it's hard to be creative every day. I do make myself go to my studio sort of nine to five. If I didn't, I'd probably never get there. Once I'm there, I'm fine. It's like going swimming. Once you're wet, you can swim. My pieces aren't figurative. They're very abstract. But maybe that's the point of artwork, is that people get that satisfaction, and they get to create things out of objects. There's um, one person says that the, the piece that they have reminds them of this wild piano. Another person says this one reminds her of sort of a cartoon car. But I don't think about those things when I'm building the pieces. I've been working with a lot of pieces that sort of have half moon um, wheels on the bottom. So I put them on there as um, just different shapes to hold up, to give it air underneath, and to give it, I guess, a little bit of animation and to get it a floating feeling. 
but I never thought about them as wheels. And when I sit down to write, I'm writing symphonies and operas. I'm writing a combination of traditional African instruments with the classical instruments. I like to perform drums, and well, I like to, to, to bring other elements into my life, like African drums, African marimbas, African dance. It's sort of, a, it alivens you. It, it's a whole continuation of, of the whole entire gamut of life, you know. Nothing is separate. I write some solo pieces for marimba. There was a piece called Tonography, which I did for marimba and clarinet and bassoon. And actually, part of it is marimba solo. I coined the word tonography, which means the choreography of the tone. <laughs> and I was trying to, to use more the marimba, or a combination of the marimba and the balafon. The African balafon has a certain buzz to it. The sound element is so sophisticated in terms of the quality of buzz. It creates a certain vibration levels. Writing for the balafon is interesting because I'm using some color schemes to relate to it. I use a white clay body. It's called earthenware, white earthenware. The reason I use that and not porcelain is that porcelain is a high temperature and it's more difficult to get as vibrant of colors and also it tends to warp or it moves more in the firing because of the high temperature and I can also get all those crazy colors that I like. The palette gets bigger and bigger every year and I keep telling myself that I'm gonna not use any color but I only do that every once in a while. And in ancient Egypt, they used a lot of hieroglyphic for music notation. The colors here uh, represent scale formations of tones. There is definite relationship to the color because the color red basically is almost 59th scale of the piano. So you really don't hear the 59th scale. And the color red is the lowest color. By the time you read to violet, you reach a fantastic high sound. That is my hunch, that when I play the music, I have to create with the sound harmonies and clashes of sound to realize those sounds that I do not hear. So I'm using the marimba, trying to simplify to, to get into this color relationship. I use religious symbols a lot and symbol of Jesus that I use a lot in Funny House, but also the color red, the color of blood, the color of suffering, to symbolize, of course, anguish and torment and darkness. Race plays a very big part in my writing. White and black, racially white and black, in reality, and I see things in terms of racial wars. And that's the history of race, races against each other. Those are the things that haunt me. My music now is, I think I haven't really changed much from the prior.
prime energy that I started with, you know, using what I know, where I grew from, and looking at the whole world. I could use any language to describe what goes on. I use my own uh, basic language I grew up with in the Nile Valley, but it's not only to the Nile, but to the whole world. It's just like painting, you know. You don't have to change the stroke or the brush that you use to explain what the landscape is about. Riverside Park, as is the whole Upper West Side, is very important to me because, first of all, it contains all of the mythology about New York. All of these really famous writers lived in New York and wrote in New York and were published in New York. I'm also very drawn to the landscape of the relationship between the apartment buildings, the street, the park, the Hudson River, and the fact that the Hudson River goes out to the Atlantic Ocean, and the Atlantic Ocean leads to the world. So it's like when I live on the Upper West Side, I'm really perched on the edge of the world, and that's very important, as is the fact that people from every nationality in the world live in my neighborhood. I had a studio originally when I moved to Cleveland in the flats, and there were great vistas out the windows of the bridges and the smokestacks, and I drove by the stadium every day, and that was a big pot to me. So I kind of transform everything into vessels. The last 15 years, I, I've been commissioned to write plays. It's a challenge because very often it has certain restrictions. For example, uh, the Great Lakes Theater Festival. I was to write a play about Ohio. And these restrictions are a very good discipline for a writer because it forces you to think about subjects that you would never think about. It's a very good discipline. People tend to try to remake pieces sometimes when they're thinking about commissions. They've said, well, we really like the piece, but could you get rid of the legs? Could I please make one with no orange? And they sort of disregard that the artist is the reason that they're getting this piece. A lot of my works has been commissioned. A commission is an engagement between the artist and the community. It's kind of an incentive to be part of the society to, that you are in. So it becomes an involvement. That's the significance to me. Things that I've often wanted, I never gotten. Things that I never even thought about, I've gotten. I don't really know, except that I still would like to write a screenplay, an Oscar-winning screenplay. <laughs> when I finish here, I'd like to be a resident with the Large Symphony Orchestra. I'd like to see a wider vision of the symphony orchestra. The capabilities has never been explored. I like to write for each musician and then combine all those elements and create for the whole thing. I have the, you know, the world vision experience that uh, is necessary. I want to see that that large orchestra doesn't die. I've always wanted to do a swimming pool for somebody. I'd like to design an interior space, be great colors. I guess I like the idea of volumes, making vessels. Swimming pool, some large bowl. Difference is sponsored by the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, finest 
the Milken Family Foundation, the Gund Foundation, and WEWS TV5. From TV5, Cleveland's live 24-hour news source.